the snakes of Australia are as diverse and striking as the landscape they inhabit. While some are largely harmless to humans, others have a decidedly dark side. The Taipan, whose bite can kill a hundred men. The Death Adder, whose strike is almost quicker than the human eye. And the Scrub Python, equipped to track down its prey wherever it may be. These snakes set spines chilling more than most. And they know how to survive in this inhospitable land. Living in the deserts, forests, and human suburbs of this vast ancient continent. Home to some of the planet's most unusual and fascinating animals. These are the secret lives of Australia's snakes. For around 50,000 years, Australia's only humans were the indigenous Aborigines. They lived side by side with the country's most dangerous animals. They even adopted a rainbow serpent as an important part of their legends. The later European settlers, though, didn't have such a philosophical attitude to the resident reptiles. They found an entire country full of dangerous creatures that lurk, slither, and scurry. In water, on land, even in the trees. There are over 800 different species of reptiles in Australia. While some are just likely to give a human a firm nip, others are the stuff of nightmares. They may be terrifying to humans, but they have their own challenges to overcome. The sheer size of Australia means it spans desert, tropical and temperate zones. The weather can be extreme and change in an instant. Sudden floods, bushfires, drought. Anything that lives here has to be as tough and adaptable as the climate and terrain. They must each have a strategy for survival. The amethystine or scrub python lives in the far northeast of the country. Queensland's wet rainforests and dry woodlands. In these wild lands, it eats brush turkeys and even small kangaroos. But this clever snake has found another world full of promise and prey. Suburbia. Far North Queensland is tropical and largely untamed. Humans tend to cluster together in pockets of habitation 
mostly along the coastline. This female scrub python feels right at home. She's used to their buildings and noise. And when she visits, she likes nothing better than a chicken dinner. So she's employing a snaky secret weapon to sniff out a potential meal, chemo reception. She's using her tongue to pick up chemical traces of odour. Inside her mouth, a structure called the Jacobson's organ analyses these scent molecules. It can determine whether the smell is prey, a rival, a potential mate, or a predator. It's been suggested their tongues are forked for directional guidance because the snakes may be able to detect which of the tips pick up the strongest scent. Snakes have evolved to fit all their organs into a long, narrow body. Their lungs, kidneys and sex organs are greatly elongated. They have two of each of these organs, but instead of lying alongside each other in a pair, one is moved down towards the tail. They don't have a collarbone, but have more ribs and vertebrae than most animals. While humans have 33 vertebrae, most snakes have between 150 and 400. This makes them extremely flexible, and along with their powerful musculature, gives them their mesmerizing, sinuous locomotion. The scrub python is Australia's largest snake, capable of reaching eight and a half metres long. So for her, suburban fences are a piece of cake. Her sense of smell leads her faithfully to the chicken coop. She begins her stakeout. enters the chicken coop in the daylight. <laughs> then settles down and waits for nightfall. She's delaying her attack. The python's eyesight isn't as good as a human's. She can't afford to make a mistake with a strike. If she misses, the chicken would not only escape, but could injure her. And the smell of chicken is now all around her. So her chemo reception equipment is of less use. As the light levels reduce, she switches to another of her prey detecting weapons. Infrared. Like many pythons, she has inbuilt heat seeking equipment. These hollows in the snake's jaw are called labial pits, thermoreceptors that enable them to see heat. As the temperature drops towards the cool of night, the heat signatures of prey show up in greater contrast. Once locked onto a living heat source, the snake can time her strike. She can stay in the same ambush site for many days, waiting for prey to get close. The python doesn't intend to wait that long. She selects her victim. Ah! 
As she constricts her coils ever tighter, she cuts off the prey's blood supply. Compressed blood vessels prevent circulation to the brain and heart, and the victim quickly dies. Now she displays another snake survival adaptation. Even though she's a large snake, the chicken, by comparison with the size of her head, is massive. Comparable to a human eating a watermelon in one mouthful. Snakes don't have any way to dismember their prey into more manageable chunks. They have to swallow it whole. So snakes' skulls are heavily modified. Although the bones around the brain case are solid like humans, the rest of the bones in the head are held together by very flexible joints. So it's capable of a vast degree of distortion. Their lower jaws are in two halves, connected at the front by just muscle and ligament. Each side of the jaw can stretch very far apart, independently of the other. The snake walks the prey in over its teeth, drenching it with saliva to ease swallowing. Then, the snake's powerful muscles contract in waves to move the prey downwards. Afterwards, she needs to coil up and rest to aid digestion, which can take a number of days. This is another snake that's so highly adaptable, it happily lives side by side with mankind. The Eastern Brown. As well as frogs and birds, it especially likes the rats and mice that always live close to human populations. It's found all along the eastern coast, from northern Queensland to South Australia, the areas most densely populated by humans. It'll happily take shelter in man-made cover, like building sites. This snake is fast, nervous, and deadly. It's responsible for around half the snake bite fatalities every year. This is the snake most likely to bite and kill a human in the whole country. The Eastern Brown is highly venomous. Venom is modified saliva containing proteins and peptides. Within the mixture, there's a deadly cocktail of toxins. In Australia, around 500 people a year are hospitalised with snake bites. The Eastern Brown's venom is neurotoxic, causing muscle weakness and paralysis. While there is an anti-venom, an Eastern Brown bite needs fast treatment. Victims who don't get it in time can die of cardiac arrest within 30 minutes of being bitten. If they don't have a heart attack, the neurotoxin travelling around their body will eventually lead to respiratory failure. It's one of the most powerful snake poisons in Australia. But there's another snake species whose venom leaves all others in the dust. The legendary Taipan. A 
Of its two main species, the inland taipan is the undisputed champion of lethality. Although it almost exclusively eats rats and mice, one bite from this snake is capable of killing a hundred men. But as it lives in the arid centre of the country, away from most human settlement, bites to people are very rare. Its cousin, the coastal Taipan, is not only more aggressive than the Shire inland, it also lives much closer to humans along the northern and eastern coasts. The python uses sharp backwards pointing teeth to secure its prey before constricting it. But the venomous snake has an ingenious way of delivering its deadly poison as quickly as possible. Fangs. These curved hollow teeth connect to venom glands. Large muscles squeeze the venom from the gland along into the fang. There are many different ways of measuring venom, but the taipans come out at the top of almost every list. Many live in the sugarcane crop fields of the northern and eastern coasts, which are usually infested with rats. So they're actually the farmer's friends. Absolutely nothing is as effective as the taipan in keeping rodent numbers down. An active hunter, the taipan uses its chemoreceptors to trail rodents back to their underground burrows, enter their homes, and envenomate everything it finds. Twelve millimeter fangs pump a deadly cocktail into the prey. Like the eastern brown, the taipan's venom is based on a neurotoxin that causes paralysis and respiratory failure. It also contains an enzyme that maximizes absorption and an agent that interferes with the body's clotting ability, causing massive internal bleeding. The victim's urine may turn reddish brown as the venom dissolves their muscles, which then pass through their kidneys. It's a murderous mixture. Until an anti-venom was developed in the 1950s, pretty much every bite to a human was fatal. But science is discovering that venom may also have the potential to save human lives. Venom is an incredibly active and complex substance, full of peptides and enzymes that are a treasure trove for medical researchers. Scientists are investigating the potential of venom-derived medicines to treat diabetes, high blood pressure, autoimmune diseases, and even cancer. These potential benefits aside, Snake venom remains one of the most noxious natural substances on the planet. Naturalists have long pondered why the deadliest snakes need their venom to be quite so toxic. One bite from a death adder or taipan is enough to kill their usual prey tens of thousands of times over. One theory on why their venom is so potent is that as the early Australian snakes were evolving millions of years ago, some of their prey began to develop a resistance to venom. As they evolved alongside each other, predator and prey may have become bound together in a biological arms race. Snake venom needed to become more and more powerful to overcome the growing immunity of their prey. 
leaving today's venomous snakes with hugely toxic venom. Perhaps supporting this theory, some animals, like this skink, do have a measure of resistance to snake venom. In energy terms, making venom is expensive. But the advantages of having it are huge. In Australia's harsh climate, where nutrients are hard to come by, having excessively deadly venom may make the difference between life and death. Being able to overpower prey so quickly means there's less chance of injury to the snake from its panicking victim. Snakes, especially juveniles, can also bring down a much larger animal than they could without venom. Larger meals mean they can go for longer without food. Essential in areas where prey is scarce. Venom is just one specialisation snakes have. As reptiles, they share some amazing adaptations to their extreme environment. This golden tree snake is sunbathing. Reptiles are ectotherms. They use external means to regulate their internal body temperature. Basking in the sun, like this monitor lizard, collects heat. When they get warm enough, their internal systems activate. Sunbathing on conductive, heat-absorbing and reflecting material like stone intensifies the effect and makes basking more efficient. Different levels of energy are needed for different tasks. For the meat eaters, like this mulga snake, sunbathing can even be urgent. He's on the prowl for some lunch. His survival strategy is to be a generalist eater. Frogs, lizards, eggs, small mammals and birds. They're all on the menu. He'll also eat carrion, as well as other snakes, and even members of his own species. When he's recently eaten, it's vital he basks in the sun. He needs to reach a body temperature high enough for him to digest his meal. If food is left long enough inside him without being digested, it can turn putrid and kill him. Before he can even think about going hunting, he has to warm up. Some snakes have found a way to attract more heat by turning themselves into solar panels. This venomous red-bellied snake flattens out its body, so there's more surface area to absorb the sun's rays. The non-venomous black-headed python has a different technique because it's vulnerable to predators. It lives in crevices or rock piles and waits for the last hour of sunlight. Then, the python pokes just its head above the safety of its home, minimising the risk of being attacked. Its black scales absorb the day's last heat rays and solar charge the snake, ready for its evening's hunting.
The black-headed python hunts by actively searching for its lizard, bird and mammal prey. Like the mulga, it too will eat other snakes. It lives throughout the top third of the country, which encompasses arid desert-like terrain, as well as tropical rainforests. Because it lives in so many different environments, each with different prey, the black-headed python is a highly adaptable hunter. Although moving around so much expends precious energy, the active hunting method is a successful strategy and common among snakes. Many venomous snakes also spend time actively tracking down their dinner rather than waiting in ambush. Using their tongues to pick up smells, they don't just stick to ground level. By lifting themselves up, they collect scent samples carried on the breeze. This gives them a different level of chemical input and more information. It all combines to make the snakes who actively search out their prey highly effective hunters. But not all snakes choose this method. This one is an ambush specialist. The green tree python is a non-venomous arboreal snake. It lives in the rainforests of the very far north of Queensland. Tropical country and full of prey. As a juvenile, it spends a lot of time on the ground, hunting small lizards and frogs. So its colouring is mottled yellow to blend in with the leaves on the rainforest floor. As it becomes adult, it turns a stunning green, the perfect camouflage in the tree canopy. It catches rodents on the ground at night. By day, it takes to the trees in search of canopy-dwelling animals. After getting into a good position, the green tree python sits and waits for prey to come within strike range. Many of its prey are well adapted to sea movement. So this snake has come up with a means to exploit that. It doesn't just passively wait for its victims. It tries to actively attract them. It wriggles the very end of its tail. This is called caudal luring. By doing this, it's trying to convince any passing reptile or bird that the tip of its tail is actually a juicy snack, like a small lizard. It's a classic ambush, with a twist. The venomous death adder also lies in wait for prey. This mouse has good senses of its own. But the death adder's colouring means that once it digs itself into the leaf litter, it's almost invisible. It lurks there. Deathly still.
the unsuspecting mouse walks right over the top of it. Although the death adder doesn't have heat pits like most of the pythons, it picks up the vibrations of the rodent. And when the mouse is close, the snake can use its eyesight to zero in on its target. The death adder has one of the fastest strikes of all snakes. It can attack, inject its venom, and be back into its original position in a quarter of a second. The kill is often swallowed head first. If the snake is low on venom, its prey may still be alive for a while after being bitten. Eating head first reduces the risk of the snake being bitten itself. All snakes are very vulnerable whilst they're eating. Their main weapons are now out of play. So they need to get every meal down as quickly as possible. And head first is the fastest. Powerful enzymes and gastric juices break down the food and the nutrients are absorbed. This process can take days or even weeks. but some prey parts get left behind. This black-headed python has no use for the fur of the rat it's just eaten. The waste material passes through the cloaca, an opening near the tail that functions as both a reproductive and digestive opening. The paler substance is the reptilian equivalent of urine, though it's far more concentrated. For many snakes, lizards are a staple part of their diet. They're both reptiles. It's thought that snakes actually evolved from lizards, slowly losing their legs. In Australia, the lizards outnumber the snakes, with more than 500 lizard species versus over 300 of snakes. The lizards have evolved many different adaptations in their attempts to stay off the menu. One is just to be very big. The lace monitor, one of the lizard family known as goannas in Australia, can reach two metres in length and 15 kilos in weight. This is a true carnivore in its own right. When fully grown, the goanna is capable of killing koalas and small kangaroos. It can even take on a snake. Like a snake, it can unhinge its jaws to envelop large prey. Also like a snake, it has a deeply forked tongue that it flicks in and out, sending the chemical messages it picks up to the Jacobson's organ in its mouth. The goanna's teeth are sharp and curved backwards, like a python's, making it hard for prey to escape. It likes to climb trees, 
where it can keep an eye on its surroundings. The trees are also a good place for the smaller monitors to escape ground-based venomous snakes called elapids. Although some elapids are good climbers, most are uncomfortable going too high. Up here, the goanna can investigate any likely hollows where it might find food. Insects, mammals, nesting birds, and even carrion. Most of Australia's lizards don't have the luxury of the monitor's enormous size. They must find other ways to deter potential predators. At between 45 and 60 centimetres, the blue-tongued skink is a fairly hefty species, but nowhere near the size of the monitor. Like other smaller lizards, it can fall prey not only to snakes, but to animals which hunt using visual cues, like cats, wild dogs and carnivorous birds. It's also a very slow-moving lizard, so it relies on bluff when confronted by a predator, by opening its mouth wide to show its brightly coloured blue tongue. It tries to look bigger and more aggressive than it really is, in an attempt to deter an attack. Discombobulating your foe is also a good way to avoid being a snake's dinner. Like the brightly coloured tongue of the skink, this frill-necked lizard has a built-in anatomical shock factor. When threatened, he opens his mouth wide and erects a huge scaly membrane that frames his head. While some snakes, like the taipan and eastern brown, are ready biters, many are actually cautious about attacking. They don't want to risk an injury that might compromise their ability to feed, so they select their prey carefully. Looking big and aggressive might just be enough to put off an attacker. Both males and females have the neck frills. This one is keeping an eye out for predators on a cycad plant. Known as living fossils, DNA studies have found the cycad species living now to be around 10 million years old a long time for any one species to remain on Earth. Their earliest ancestors were around long before dinosaurs ruled the planet, and fossil records suggest they probably dominated the ancient forests. Most are long-lived and slow-growing. For the frill-necked lizard, the plant makes a handy perch and a good vantage point. Some, like this shingleback lizard, try to confuse their enemies. Its tail is pretty much identical to its head, which it hopes will befuddle a predator long enough for it to make its getaway. A truly cunning disguise could also help one avoid becoming lunch. There is a lizard on this tree. This is a leaf-tailed gecko. His markings look like patchy tree bark and lichen. This disruptive patterning is the same principle that military camouflage gear is based on. His base colouring is specialised to the area he lives in. If a gecko lives in a grove with paler trees, it will have paler colouring to match. In the next patch of forest, which may have darker trees, 
it'll have corresponding dark skin. His spiny flanks diffuse any telltale shadows. Bird-like clawed feet help him climb over the rough bark. Motionless, the leaf tail waits for spiders and insects like crickets and moths to come within range. Because he spends all night in position, he needs large eyes to let in as much light as possible. The downside to this is that he has a reflective retina. So at night, the gecko's telltale eye shine is a dead giveaway to his nocturnal predators. Owls, rats and snakes. But even when he may be staring into the scaly jaws of certain death, he has a last ditch trick up his sleeve. If things are looking desperate, the leaf-tailed gecko wriggles his tail to draw attention to it. Should the snake take the bait and attack the tail, the gecko can actually disengage it from his body and drop it. This gives the snake a temporary mouthful while the gecko makes a getaway. Its tail regrows in just six to eight weeks. Lizards and snakes are built to survive their tough environment. But while snakes may seem terrifying and indomitable, many of them are themselves under threat from other species. There is one animal that easily kills even the most deadly snake, the cane toad. Imported into Australia from South America in the 1930s, the cane toad was introduced specifically to prey on pest beetles in the sugarcane fields. It was entirely ineffective against the beetles, but much worse was to come. The cane toad is itself highly poisonous, with glands on its back and sides that excrete potent toxins. Almost anything that tries to eat it, dies. Many snakes eat amphibians and unwittingly take cane toads. They don't get a chance to have any sort of learning curve about avoiding this prey. The toads are so toxic, snakes will die with the toads still in their mouths. Many native species are only too happy to get a snake snack. Especially if it's a vulnerable juvenile. The jabiru, or black-necked stork, is a whopping one and a half metres tall and easily capable of taking a snake. As are many of the big birds of prey that live all over the country. Predatory birds and foreign toads aren't the only threats to snakes. Bushfires are the terror of the outback. There are apocryphal stories of bushfires spreading faster than a galloping horse. It's certainly true that they're devastating for animal life. A fire like this can start from a lightning strike and last for days, taking out the animal's cover and food. Most try to flee, many die. But while many snakes will be killed by fire, the black-headed python is able to use a bushfire to its own advantage. It's a capable climber, but just as happy to stay safe from the flames 
by going underground or into small cramped rock crevices. This all-terrain beast has the largest array of options to survive a bushfire. Regrowth starts again after around six weeks and small mammals and reptiles move back in as soon as they can. They form a veritable feast for the black-headed python who's been able to wait it out. The snakes of Australia all have their part to play in the ecosystem and many perform vital roles in pest control. From the rodent eating of the taipan and hunting prowess of the scrub python to the cunning caudal lure of the green tree python and the death adder's lightning strike. Australia's snakes have found ways of flourishing in this severe terrain. Beautiful, bizarre, and often deadly. The snakes of Australia continue to inhabit a prominent place in our imaginations as well as our nightmares.